Commander Kirk Lippold is joining me now. KirkLippold.com, former commander of the USS Cole. Commander, it's always great to have you on the show. Thank you, Scott. Great to be back on again. I want to talk about some current events with, with you, obviously, but but all of your time in the Navy, as we're, we're looking at the devastation from Hurricanes Milton and Helene in the last couple of weeks, did you ever have to, to steer? I don't know what it's called. Did you ever have to take one of your ships through a big storm like that? Did we ever have to sortie out of port to avoid the hurricane? Yeah. Yes, we did. Um, I took command of USS Cole in June of 1999, and that fall we had Hurricane Floyd come up the East Coast, and they actually sortied most of the fleet that could get underway out of Norfolk, Virginia, where we had to what they call cross the T, which means that you take the direction and you want to get on what they call the less dangerous semicircle. In other words, that that part of the uh, hurricane that is to the east, and we got out there, and then we went south alongside the uh, east coast out at sea at about 450 miles south, and then turned around and slowly followed the hurricane back in, and uh, I was fortunate in that the uh, Aegis guided missile destroyers have an extremely good hull-keeping form, so while a lot of other ships were literally getting pounded out there, uh, we were riding it out well, but that didn't mean that a lot of my crew didn't have plastic bags tied around their belt. <laughs> uh, I've, I'm from the Gulf Coast, so I've been through dozens of hurricanes on land, but I was on one fateful cruise, I don't know, like 10 years ago, that uh, skirted the outskirts of a hurricane just off the, the coast of Turks and Caicos, and that was a wild ride. I've also been in a hurricane hunter out of Keesler Air Force Base. That was an experience too. But being on the being on the rocking boat, although I did get a great night's sleep down in my windowless cabin later that night. Well, it's it's definitely uh, definitely a tough ride. And for those people that that have seasickness, they they have my <laughs> greatest sympathy in the world. Uh, you know, knock on wood, Scott. Uh, I don't get that kind of motion sickness. So. You know, when the bosun maid and I are talking on the bridge about having smoked oysters on pumpernickel bread with warm mayonnaise, uh, you know, the rest of the crew was not happy with us, and we were getting a good chuckle out of it. Commander Kirk Lippold here on the Scott Sand Show. Commander, you and I talk uh, uh, every once in a while about what's happening around the world and foreign affairs and some of the conflicts that, that the American military has found itself embroiled in, and, and I continue to watch what's happening between Israel and, and a number of Iranian proxies including the Houthis, who since last November, I believe, have targeted more than 100 ships. I think they've sank a couple. I think they've hijacked some of these. And I saw a headline not too long ago that this might be the most intense combat the U.S. Navy has faced since World War II. What are you saying is that that conflict continues and Israel expands their fronts? I think at some point, Scott, I'm going to go back to the saying you've heard me say before and on your last show, and that is solve the problem, not the symptom. Going after the proxy groups does not solve the problem. What you have to do is target the state sponsors of terrorism, in this case, the number one state sponsor of terrorism in the world, and that is Iran. There are a number of things we can do, starting with sanctions and putting them into place. And I really don't care what our whiny European allies may say about the fact that they have trade relationships with them. And then we can start a maritime interdiction regime to make sure that no weapons get to the Houthis, that no weapons get to Hamas or Hezbollah. And we begin to ensure that we slowly squeeze the noose around Iran so that hopefully it will give the people of that country the ability to make their own decision about the future and overthrow the mullahs. That would be the ultimate goal. But in the meantime, before we go kinetic, let's put all these other things into place. But guess what? Your enemy gets a vote on whether you get into a conflict. And Iran has been killing Americans hundreds of Americans over the past 40 plus years and it is time to hold them accountable for their terrorists right now what, what our military strategy is is not working just in the past week US military forces targeted 15 Houthi targets five locations uh, using tomahawk uh, land uh, attack cruise missiles and and they continue to attack our vessels they continue to attack Israel obviously we're, we're not deterring them and these these pinprick attacks you're absolutely right. I mean, if you're going to have a military that is going to have global power and reach and that you want to, in fact, influence national security here at home, you really need two things. 
you have to have the capability to be able to reach out and ensure your enemies do not threaten you. But number two, and more importantly, you have to have the credibility that you're willing to use the instruments of national power, diplomacy, economic, information, and military as a last resort to hold these countries accountable. And I think that unfortunately, because we are coming into an election year and, and we're literally weeks away from electing a new president, there is a reluctance on the part of the Biden administration to do what's necessary to safeguard us for the long term here at home. And that's true with Iran. That is true with Russia. It's true with China. And that we are allowing them to essentially run roughshod over our national security interests for fear they might lose a vote. Well, guess what? The American people right now want leadership. And they are not getting it from the Biden-Harris administration. Commander, how uh, do you see what's happening in the Red Sea as being a separate foreign policy crisis than what's happening with Israel against Hamas and Hezbollah? No, they're all intertwined and together. The root cause is Iran and what they are doing in, in funding these groups. I mean, the Obama administration gave them billions of dollars. And even today, while they say, oh, we can keep, uh, you know, the, the, the money that we are allowing to be freed up because we lift sanctions is only going toward humanitarian causes. You know what? M- money is fungible. In other words, every dollar that we give them or allow them to have for humanitarian reasons frees up a dollar somewhere else to build a drone, to build a ballistic missile, to build a rocket, to build nuclear weapons and that's what we are doing right now by not holding them accountable and and we've heard from the foreign minister of iran who says that it will continue to support its proxy groups however necessary and will stand strongly by the resistance that was on al jazeera earlier today and you, you got to take them at their word and and i think the insolution as you have said as i have said for for months now is Someone's got to go after Iran. That, that's the only, that's got to be the end game for Israel. Right now, I don't believe the Biden Harris administration would support an attack by Israel directly on Iran, but that's the only way you end this. Well, I, I think, Scott, when you look at it, Israel's in a position right now where they are truly the leader in the Middle East. And why? because they're getting ready to do what's necessary for their long national, long-term long national security interests. And that Iran has shot ballistic missiles at them, not once, but twice. It is essentially a declaration of war, even though it's not been officially announced. And, and I think that uh, President uh, Netanyahu is doing the right thing. You know, at a time and a place and lethality and a preciseness of their choosing – They're going to strike Iran, and the United States better back them, because if we don't have the moral clarity and the strategic vision to do what's necessary, then we better be backing those that do, especially the only elected democracy in the Middle East. Commander Kirk Lippold here on the Scott Sancho. Commander, are you surprised we haven't seen a more direct attack on U.S. interests either abroad or here at home, I mean, just this morning, last night, we learned of an Afghan man uh, arrested on charges of planning a terror attack on Election Day who apparently worked for the CIA as a security guard in Afghanistan. I, that, that, I, I'm, I'm shocked that that would be allowed to happen. How do we not properly vet security guards at a CIA base? Well, I'm sure we did. I'm sure we gave it the best that we could, but he could have been radicalized since he came to the United States. He may have seen, you know, it depends on who he was with and what support we gave him when we arrived there. You got to remember that a security clearance that gives you access to that type of sensitive information is from a snapshot in time, and the world can change after that. I mean, to, to the credit of the CIA and the FBI and others that are working very hard to keep this nation safe, they work in a zero defect environment. That means you do nothing wrong because if you do, there are consequences and it's going to be measured in lives. So I think it's a real testament that we actually did catch this guy and who knows how many other plots out there that we have thwarted, bypassed, disrupted through our actions here that we never hear about, nor should the public hear about, because quite frankly, loose lips sink ships. That phrase still applies. So, you know, hopefully none will get through. 
I would be shocked if we get from here to Election Day without a terrorist incident happening here in this country. But I think like your listeners, I'm praying that it doesn't and that we can have an election that is going to be fair and open and that we will be able to get the next president elected regardless of who it is. Israel's security cabinet is voting on a response to Iran's most recent missile attack. How do you think that plays out? Kind of gaze into your crystal ball. If you were advising uh, Bibi Netanyahu, what would you recommend? I would take actions that are necessary that are going to deter Iran from any follow-on strikes. I would also look at doing what's necessary to kind of get a, a get a two-for-one effect. You know, one of the things that I mentioned that if if there have to be strikes into Iran, take out the things that threaten Israel, like the ballistic missile engines. Those are the most complicated part of that rocket. Take out the drones. You not only take away threats to Israel, but you also cripple, cripple Russia's ability to continue to pound the daylights out of the Ukrainians. So I think that there could be multiple things that you could do. If Iran does decide they want to have a third attack, well, then it's going to be game on for their oil facilities. And then what we as the United States and our allies need to do is protect all those other oil fields. And that while we may be close to being energy independent, Europe, Japan, our South Asia allies are not. And we need to protect the oil coming out of the Middle East with them in order to make sure that the economy. sure if I lost the commander there or not. Still showing up on my screen, but I believe I lost him. There he is. Oh, Scott. <laughs> there, there he is. I'll let you, okay. i let you finish your thought, commander. No, it's, it, I, I basically said that, you know, you want to go for the kinds of facilities that threaten Israel. You want to take out the yeah. ballistic missile engine factories, the drone factories. And then if Iran decides they want to up their game, Take out the things that are going to cripple their economy, the, nat- the, the gasoline refining facilities, because that's going to take down the economy. And then the people of Iran are going to realize that the irresponsible behavior of the mullahs is making their life miserable. And that's when our opportunity comes in to help them overthrow them. And I think at some point Israel's got to look at the nuclear capabilities of Iran as well and, and take that out or at least slow them down a little bit. Absolutely. And while they may have done that to a degree, I think at this point we have to be realistic. Iran, Iran has continued to use the centrifuges to get the purity that they needed for weapons-grade uranium. And those facilities, that we're, we're really be getting beyond negotiation at this yeah, point. Absolutely. Iran is in such extreme violation, we need to take out those facilities. Commander Kirk Lippold, kirklippold.com, a true hero, a true leader. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you, Scott.